to um, our latest talk in the Russian and Eurasian security research series here from the Department of War Studies, King's College London, obviously coming to you virtually for now. Um, I'm talking to you from the UK, and then I am delighted to have with me also Professor Elizabeth Wierschnick from the United States. She is Professor of Political Science Montclair State University and also a senior research scholar at the Weatherhead East Asian Institute, part of Columbia University. And um, Professor Wishnik has been working on Russia-China relations um, for quite some time, um, but has also expanded into other areas. But I can't think of anyone better really um, to talk about this. Um, when I was writing my PhD on Russian relations with China and Japan, you know, her, she was one of the few people working on that area at the time. Um, and I'm also delighted to have here today, um, Dr. Marcin Kashmarsky from Glasgow University, lecturer in security studies. And um, Marcin and I, I think met her some time ago um, at a conference and realized that we were two of um, only a handful of people still at that time working on, on the area. So it's a great pleasure to, to have Marcin and Elizabeth um, here today. Um, and what we're going to do today is to, um, to look in the time allotted um, at actually a huge topic, but we're going to try and kind of focus in on a few areas um, of the Sino-Russian rapprochement. Um, what are the drivers and limitations of this very important relationship? Um, and there is, you know, this is the kind of topic that really invites a lot of speculation and um, you know, I'm sure you will have noticed that the media um, is often prone to um, rather hyping up this relationship, um, but also policymakers sometimes have a tendency to, um, you know, sort of blow up this relationship into um, out of proportion, perhaps some might say, um, you know, so that question, of course, comes up time and again, you know, is this relationship an alliance or is it moving towards an alliance or is it something else? you know, how close is it and what is this relationship actually based on? And I think given, um, you know, the new administration that we now have in the United States, um, the question of the relationship of these two members of the P5, who also, um, you know, wield a certain amount of power in their own regions, if you like, um, is really um, quite a, a pressing issue. Um, so we will also touch a little bit on what we might expect um, in terms of the Russia-China relationship from the new Biden administration. Um, so I'd like to invite um, Professor Wishnik to begin the proceedings. Um, she'll talk um, a little bit about what she thinks are the main challenges um, of this relationship. Thank you. Thank you, Natasha, uh, for inviting me. Um, it's a pleasure to, uh, to talk to all of you about this important topic. Um, so as, as, uh, as uh, Dr. Kurt mentioned, there has been a lot of uh, speculation about this uh, relationship, this Im important partnership. And um, there have been characterizations that discount uh, the consequence of this relationship, calling it transactional uh, and uh, fundamentally not very durable. Others also uh, have focused on the asymmetry involved uh, with Russia being a dependent, a uh, junior partner, and uh, seeing this relationship also as one that one or the other might abandon uh, for this reason. Um, and by contrast, there are a few more common in the United States during the Trump administration was to focus on the great power competition um, viewpoint uh, and uh, seeing the US factor as, as key in terms of um, serving or critics of the Trump policy would see this, this um, approach as motivating uh, China and Russia to seek a closer partnership. And so I'm, I think these are, these are uh, approaches that you've all heard of um, if you're following this topic, but I would like to propose um, a different approach in terms of what is driving them. I think 
to understand what's driving them, we need to look at when did this rapprochement really begin to, to uh, come together. And I think I would date it from 2008, from the, from the financial crisis, when China and Russia look at the disarray in the global economy and the, and the, uh, the weakness of Western states and try to uh, create some kind of alternatives of their own. And so this is not to discount the perceptions of Western pressure that they each feel and the problems and relations that each has with the United States. But I think uh, that what has served as the anchor for this uh, relationship is the, is the uh, agreement that they have on various uh, values and uh, norms of international behavior and the joint effort that they have to delegitimize Western values and to promote alternative ones that support their domestic narratives. Because this partnership, I think, contributes very much to the ability of Putin and of uh, Xi Jinping to uh, maintain their political hold domestically. So for example, um, the, the, the principle of non-interference in relation in the uh, affairs of authoritarian states, uh, the portrayal of democracies in the US uh, in particular as unstable and ineffective, uh, use of disinformation uh, campaigns in different ways and repression of uh, democratic movements at home. I think all of these are of a piece to, to counter these Western values. And also um, a, a second component of this is to create alternative approaches to various international problems, uh, for example, to denuclearize the Korean Peninsula and to create an East Asian order that would be more conducive to, to their own domestic goals. And so I wouldn't say they have identical approaches, but they have parallel ones. And they don't act much uh, multi in multilateral for, although they are, a they are members of many together, I think they act more on a bilateral basis within a multilateral context. And they are also neutral where they disagree. So they don't always agree. They don't have identical ways of going about these efforts to create alternative approaches. But I think that they, they do have this joint quest to develop some kind of alternative frameworks that are more conducive to their domestic, uh, their domestic goals. However, I would say that in the regions, uh, they, they have different regional identities that will create some barriers. And I'm gonna just briefly mention two different areas where I think this is the case. One is in the Arctic. That's a region I've been following closely lately. And China, as you may know, is advancing a near Arctic identity to justify its growing participation in this important region. And I think this runs across purposes with Russia's Arctic identity, which is rooted in its, its um, geographically and historically and, um, and economically in terms of the importance of the regions for the Russian resource, uh, uh, resource connected GDP. Um, and so I think this is a region to watch in terms of how Russia and China will interact in the future, especially as Russia takes uh, the leadership of the Arctic Council um, this coming spring. And then Central Asia. Uh, so Marge and I, I think, will disagree perhaps on this uh, on this issue. I think I I think that this is an area where Russia and China so far have managed not to compete uh, very overtly. Um, but there are some new challenges on the horizon. And also I wanna mention the case of COVID, which has showed a new arena for competition. So one, one issue is hard security. The division of labor has always been, China provides the economic goods and Russia provides the 
security. But recently, China is becoming more involved in security with using uh, its own border forces in Tajikistan and private security companies in Afghanistan. And so what will this mean going forward for this unofficial division of labor? Is this going to cause some, uh, some consternation in Russia? And, and uh, what kind of uh, reaction will there be in the region? And turning to the region, I, I found it interesting to look at the vaccine situation in Central Asia and who's buying whose vaccine. And uh, so while on the surface, you see cooperation between China and Russia in terms of combating uh, COVID-19, uh, mutual support um, for their positions on the issue, some efforts to joint development of vaccines. Uh, there's a Chinese vaccine being tested in Russia. Um, also some joint disinformation about the US responsibility uh, for this virus. However, in Central Asia, you see some competition in terms of which countries are using which kind, uh, Russian or Chinese vaccines. And both are promoting them. But so far, what I've found is only Uzbekistan has committed to a Chinese vaccine. Um, Kyrgyzstan, Kazakhstan, um, and uh, Turkmenistan, which claims it has no COVID, are, are <laughs> all using the, the Sputnik V vaccine. And others are also um, hoping for the COVAX, the uh, WHO vaccine. So it's interesting that Russia is, has more vaccine dominance in, in uh, Central Asia than China, despite China's uh, effort to promote a Silk Road uh, health diplomacy. And you would think that this would be a part of development aid that China would be proposing to Central Asia, but in fact, it hasn't worked out that way. And I, I, I think that's it's a curious, I wasn't expecting to find this result when I was looking into it, but I find that's a, an interesting uh, indication that Russia still has some, um, is trying to maintain its, its uh, soft power in this region through non-traditional means. And I, I don't wanna go on too long, but there are other areas where I think Russia and China are at odds in this region over non-traditional security issues like water rights and so on. So I'll stop there. Thank you very much. Great, uh, thank you. Um, and that was a fascinating uh, detail there on the vaccines, um, you know, because um, I guess vaccine nationalism is um, has been a part of the pandemic. I mean, even here in the UK, I think, um, but you know, clearly, as you say, this sort of maybe slightly hidden soft power competition uh, there in Central Asia. Um, and, you know, as you say, I think, you know, the respective roles of uh, Russia and China in Central Asia, particularly with the BRI, and then Russia kind of promoting the idea of the greater Eurasian partnership. Um, you know, um, there is debate, obviously, um, among academics and others as to, you know, um, essentially, uh, what China's aims are in Central Asia and the extent to which um, Russia might accommodate those aims and what, you know, what it is exactly that China um, wishes, um, you know, to achieve um, in the longer term. Um, and um, as you said, um, Martian has a slightly different take um, to you. Um, I tend also slightly to be a little more skeptical about um, Russia, China and Central Asia, but um, I would um, be very interested now to hear uh, Martin, your uh, take on this. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Natasha. Thank you for uh, the opportunity to, to be here. It's, it's a real pleasure. And what I find a bit problematic is that I agree with almost anything what, what Professor Wishing has, has just said. So <laughs> I, I will try to address some other aspects um, and return to, to Central Asia a bit a bit later. So if I were to sum up the um, Sino-Russian relationship today in, in one sentence, I would uh, say that it's a, an ever closer relationship, but the obstacles to a, what we could term a fully fledged alliance 
continue continue to persist. And if we if, if we are to start with um, external factors or external pressures that uh, to what extent they they are drivers of, of the relationship, it has been a constant thread in, in, in the IRR literature that it is the US policy that pushes Russia and China closer together. And we can trace it back to the year 2000 and to Kenneth Walt's article where, where already at that time he indicated that it is the US that pushes um, both states closer together. So from this perspective, and according to this logic, what we should have expected is another stage of, of cooperation after late 2017, early 2018, when the US puts Russia and China uh, on the same level as, as strategic competitors. But despite these dual pressures or these, despite this conducive uh, in quotation mark environment, we have not seen such such development. So I, I would argue that the, the picture of Sino-Russian relations for the last three years have, have has been quite quite mixed. Because on the on the one hand, what we have seen has been the flourishing of cooperation in, in a number of areas: security and defense, energy cooperation, uh, normative opposition to to towards the West. But at the same time. Uh, we have seen Russia uh, ha <clears throat> having more and more difficulties walking this fine line between China and India and trying to stay neutral during their their conflict. Uh, Russia has limited means to to support China in the rivalry with the U.S. Even if it if it uh, genuinely wanted in in such areas as technology investment or or trade and trade and financial markets. It is also a similar case with, with the South China Sea, with Russia trying to walk this, this fine line uh, between, uh, between China and, and its traditional partners like, like uh, Vietnam. So when discussing drivers of, of the relationship, we should uh, also pay attention to at least three three other elements. So firstly, the domestic politics, which, which Elizabeth mentioned um, some aspects of this. Mm, it certainly facilitates Sino-Russian cooperation. But I would argue that it mitigates the effects of, of power asymmetry. The fact that China is not a threat to Russia in terms of regime security and regime survival ma makes the Kremlin more willing to accept the fact that China's both the distribution of material capabilities is very biased towards China, and China's influence has been has been growing. Or, for instance, in, in Central Asia. At the same time, there is a growing number of of domestic players in Russia who benefit from from China's rise, and from for whom the perspective of closer relations is um, is um, very promising. With with the energy industry, both state-owned enterprises like Rosneft, or private companies like Novatech, which, uh, which have clearly benefited from cooperation with, the, with, with China. Secondly, I would, I would draw our attention to, to, to a kind of learning process on the part of, of, the Russian, of the Russian elite. Just as in the case of relations with the West, we continue to argue that Russian bad experiences with the West, so that the bad experiences of the Russian elite with the, with the Western the Western policy pushed Russia into a more assertive approach. I would I would say that in the case of China, positive expectations or positive experiences make Russia uh, make the Russian elite less um, to perceive China as 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 less threatening. Mm. And for me, the still the case is is here the reaction of of Beijing towards the Ukrainian crisis. Finally, I, I would uh, I would um, argue that we should remember about unintended consequences of, 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 of the Russian policy and, to what it, and should not see the relationship as driven only by rational, strategic, intentional, intentional actions. Mm, for the last decades, Russian Russian leaders have been repeating about the turn to the east and the turn to Asia. Ultimately, they ended. They have ended up with, with um, 
they turn to China with uh, limited room for maneuver vis-a-vis -vis other partners. Mm, if we look at uh, such uh, recent developments in China Russian cooper security cooperation as joint bomber patrols, which were conducted both in late 2019 and towards the variant of 2020, they do not help Russia to uh, establish good relations or cordial relations with with Japan or South Korea, they are specifically uh, serving Chinese rather than, than Russian purposes. And I would not like to exaggerate the Russia's dependence on, on China, but still I would see it as, as problematic for Russia in terms of, in terms of growing, growing asymmetry uh, in, in its relationship with China and inability to to balance it even in, in, uh, for the last couple of years when, when China faced uh, such numerous pressures from, from the US. So perhaps I will stop here and to Natasha. Thank you, Martin. Um, yeah, uh, that was a great summary, I think really of, um, you know, and a kind of warning, if you like, of not, um, you know, not assuming that, you know, Russia and China are um being pushed together um by what's happening elsewhere if you like that you know the relationship has a kind of momentum of its own and i think we do need to remember that that momentum has been building since at least 1989 and you know gorbachev <clears throat> the window on the asia pacific and so on but as you say also unintended consequences and unintended developments i mean you know um when the Soviet Union collapsed, um, you know, Russian Federation uh, foreign policy, policy towards Asia, you know, that the idea of, um, you know, a very close relationship with China, I think, was seen as actually not really on the cards, particularly at all, um, you know, and, um, you know, for the first couple of years, it was very much Japan that was going to be, you know, the key partner. Um, you know, obviously things have changed very much since then for all sorts of reasons, um, you know, and unfortunately the Japanese, Russia-Japan relationship um, is still, um, you know, very much kind of hobbled, if you like, by the uh, territorial issue amongst others. Um, but Japan obviously keeps a very close eye on what's happening with Russia and China. Um, and, you um, you know, I think um, what you said about um, the asymmetry in relations, I mean, really, although trade has, of course, increased year on year and, you know, is now probably about $100 um, billion turnover, um, you know, which is, it's obviously come on in leaps and bounds, but, um, but as before, obviously, we see that, um, you know, huge, uh, proportion of um, raw materials, hydrocarbons and so on, making up the trade turnover and that hasn't changed. If anything, I think it's got actually worse. I mean, as in, you know, the raw material hydrocarbon component of um, bilateral trade, um, you know, Russian exports to China essentially are raw materials, um, you know, but the Russian government hasn't really done anything to change, to try to change that. You know, for all sorts of reasons, as you said, there are domestic players who benefit from that cooperation. Um, you know, um, so um, you know, positive experiences are different. You know, perhaps that's one of the positive experiences. You know, rent seeking. Um, but I guess what's maybe interesting to think about as well is there's this economic dependence. Um, quite clearly, um, you know, at what point does that translate into some kind of um, dependence politically because you know do they go you know is there a relationship between the two or not really um, because obviously for a lot especially in the 1990s the whole idea of Russia being a raw materials appendage a resource appendage of China was very much um, you know in the air um, I mean these days it's become much less of a, a trope but I think um, that was really very much um, kind of utilized um, in order to denigrate um, the idea of closer relations with China. So I just wondered um, if, you know, uh, Liz um, and then Martian, you know, what, what do you think about, um, you know, this asymmetry, you know, is it really, does it really matter? You know, maybe it doesn't matter, you know, does it, 
in the longer term, what kinds of repercussions might it have, do you think? I, I'd like to say, I think the issue of asymmetry is often overemphasized. And I think that that's because we don't take into account what China gets from this partnership. Because China without Russia would really have very few friends. David Shambaugh once described China as a lonely, a lonely power. And I think that's right. I mean, who are China's other closest friends? And Pakistan, and at least on paper, uh, North Korea. <laughs> so um, these, are, these are problematic friends. And, and so without Russia, I think China would find itself very isolated, especially in the UN. Um, and also uh, China uh, benefits from these resources that, China, that Russia is sending. And the number two source or number one, depending on the year of oil for, for China, increasing uh, gas cooperation. And now this, this Arctic route which is uh, very important for China's ability to be a participant in the region. Without Russia, I think it would be hard for China to, to uh, be able to implement many of its goals in the Arctic. Um, and similarly with Central Asia, uh, even though uh, China has expanded its influence, I think this is, this is uh, because China and Russia have have come to this uh, partnership that um, enables China to do that. And, and some China scholars are very, um, are, are very aware that Russia can try to limit China's role in the region and does to some, to some extent. Um, so I think that, that partly the, the view of the asymmetry is because Rus the Russian side talks a lot about it. Um, they they securitize this this problem, and China does the opposite. They desecuritize and say, "Oh, we we may have uh, different strengths, but this doesn't mean we're an unequal partnership." Um, so so I I think that 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 we need to keep in mind that China also benefits and needs Russia in certain ways, and it's not just Russia being dependent on the Chinese market. I think you're right there um, to emphasize the fact that China does need Russia. Um, so I suppose the question is what, you know, why, you know, why does Russia um, highlight this dependence, you know, and the asymmetry, you know, who is the audience, if you like, that they're talking to with that narrative, you know, is it the West or, or is it, you know, domestic factions and players within Russia? I don't know if there's an answer to that, but <laughs> um, Martin. Yeah, um, I would say that when, when we speak about the asymmetry, we need to go beyond just seeing it as, as a pure asymmetry in terms of, of material power and in terms of um, just GDP and military budgets, but also look at how, how much uh, China's influence comes at Russia's expense. And, what, uh, what we have discussed before um, about Central Asia, uh, the process of China encroaching into the security realm is one of these elements of growing asymmetry, which Russia cannot balance by increasing its presence in, in East Asia, because in East Asia, it is rather Russia that is following in China's, in China's footsteps. When we speak about the um, uh, export of energy resources to to, 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 to the Asian market. Russia made itself dependent on the Chinese market in terms of both the oil pipeline to, to, to China, which for which the part of, of the uh, East Siberia Pacific Ocean pipeline, which, which goes to China, but also the power of Siberia gas pipeline, which, which cannot go anywhere else. Uh, and all the ideas of um, building a pipeline to Korea or building an uh, LNG, Terminal uh, Vladivostok LNG, they came to nothing because of focus or forced by the Kremlin to uh, to strike a deal with with China. So from, I would argue that from this perspective, Russia has made itself dependent on China. But certainly, there there is 
what we can term as both self-restraint restraint and strategic patience on the part of China. Because um, uh, if, we, if we discuss the Belt and Road Initiative, Russia's brinkmanship and Russia's aggressive policy, for instance, towards Ukraine, generated a lot of uh, difficulties for, for the change project. It completely turned off or sh shut down the, the route via Ukraine since 2014, and it's only since 20, late 2019 when, when Russia agreed that cargo transports from China and to Europe and the other way around can go via, via Ukraine. And we don't know whether it was the pressure from the Russian participants in the Belt and Road, so mostly from the Russian railways, or was it was the case of China pushing pushing Russia to, to change its its policy? And I would see the implications, the long-term implications of uh, of the asymmetry as a situation in which Russia will be forced with with um, uneasy choices, uh, especially if if China's uh, foreign policy becomes more aggressive and if China pushes its uh, its neighbors like India or, or Vietnam further than Russia has been able to, to resist this pressure so far. But the question I would say is how, how long is it, is it possible for Russia to keep this, this balance? Thank you, Martin. Um, yes, I mean, obviously East Asia, or should we call it the Indo-Pacific now, which is, you know, what the US has been calling it for a while. Um, and of course, Russia, I mean, Lavrov has made quite a big fuss um, about um, it being called the Indo-Pacific, um, you know, and has um, really sort of um, expressed uh, Russia's displeasure um, at this kind of branding or rebranding, if you like, of the region. Um, and obviously that's, um, I think, a point uh, where we kind of remind ourselves um, that Russia also has um, a so-called strategic partnership with India, you know, which is, you know, um, a long-standing relationship. Um, Liz, I don't know if you'd like to come in on that. And maybe here we could link to a little bit to maybe the new administration in the White House. I wanted to go back to a point that that uh, Martian made about uh, about how China limits Russia's Asia policy. Um, I think that what limits Russia's Asia policy is the Russian economy, that the weakness of the Russian economy has really prevented Russia from being a big player in the Asia Pacific. I think um, I, I don't see the, the partnership with China really uh, constraining uh, Russia too much, except in perhaps in multilateral fora. But um, on its own, I think Russia has been expanding its network in the regions in Southeast Asia, beyond Vietnam, and maintaining its partnerships with Vietnam and India. And I think that gives Russia some leverage because Russia can increase arms sales to India, can speed up uh, as 400 um, sales, can can uh, create new, new um, energy exploration agreements with Vietnam. So I think Russia has some disruptive power um, if, if it feels that, that China is overstepping in other, in other ways. And I, th I think the energy projects, I mean, the, the gas pipeline admittedly can only go to China, but, but other projects also go to Asia, like the Espo pipe, oil pipeline has sales to Asia. The Arctic projects that China is invested in also will supply uh, other Asian countries, and there are other Asian investors in the Arctic, including Vietnam and, and India. Um, so, I, so I, I know about the Indo-Pacific. I think Russia is concerned that the U.S. is trying to pry India away from from Russia as a partner, and and India is a long-standing partner, and it's not uh, it's. It's not a partnership that's directed at China. It's it's a parallel partnership that, or even predating the China partnership in many ways, that Russia wants to maintain. And so it's it's looking at how the U.S. is creating or trying to reaffirm its um, partnerships in the region, especially with the Biden approach, which is likely to improve relations with South Korea and Japan and to reprioritize um, engaging with Asian allies while maintaining the Trump administration's 
earlier focus on India. So I think that creates um, a challenge for Russia, but so does the China-India border clashes. <laughs> and so I, I'm sure Russia is not, um, is not very happy about this outcome because on many levels, Russia would agree with India about the importance of observing borders and not with the Chinese more flexible understanding of border zones, which has been an impediment to Russia-China relations in the, in the uh, Russian Far East. Um, so I, I think this is a very tricky uh, issue for Russia. They've been trying to uh, stay neutral, uh, but uh, Chinese actions may test them. So I think this is, this is a, an issue to watch going forward. Oh, and I think that's what you about the US. Uh, so, so in terms of US policy, we don't really have too many clues about whether the Biden administration is going to continue with this focus on great power competition or not. I mean, there are some indications that um, uh, from an article that, that our national security advisor, Jake Sullivan, wrote about how we should reframe the China challenge as not being a quest for a regional hegemony in Asia, but being a broader uh, geoeconomic challenge in terms of China seeking to play a, a more leading role in global governance. And I think that that is the argument I was trying to make for why China and Russia are cooperating because they can do this together in terms of internet governance or uh, using uh, ruble yuan uh, payments for things or you know trying to create alternatives to the US or Western led order. Uh, so I think that there's some attention to this issue um, and we'll have to see going forward how the Biden team navigates uh, between Russia and China. Yeah, thank you, Liz, because I think Biden has called Russia an opponent and China a serious competitor, which kind of suggests there's a little bit of a hierarchy there. Um, um, Martin, would you like to say anything about um, you know, perhaps US, uh, potential US policy going forward and the implications for the rapprochement um, or perhaps policy recommendations that you might have, you know, how should they, what would be the ideal approach if you were yourself the US National Security Advisor? All right. Or Secretary of State? Right, right, right after the elections, we we've seen signals from, from the Biden administration that it wants to establish a serious dialogue with, with Europe on the issue of, of China and the issue of Sino-Russian relationship entered the agenda of, of NATO. It was supposed, it found its, its, pla its place in, in the report uh, prepared by, by advisors to NATO Secretary General. But what I, what I am very, very surprised by is the policy of Europe, actually. So the the fact that the European Union, uh, without waiting for the transition in, in Washington, has decided to opt for a uh, investment agreement with, with China, which actually makes all the idea, the, the whole idea of, of a transatlantic dialogue on, on China and possibly on, on the Sino-Russian relationship, much more, much more difficult. Um, I, I would, prior to this, I, I would have, I would, I would see a much more robust transatlantic approach to, to China and, and Russia and to the Sino-Russian relationship. But at this stage, I don't think that the, the China has much to, to be afraid of uh, in terms of a strong shared position of, of, of Western states. And of course, it depends on, on the developments within Europe and to what extent those who oppose the, the agreement are able to to either prevent its its ratification or are able to force this type of transatlantic dialogue on, on China. But I, I think that now I would say that now the, the the Biden administration faces a serious test when when it comes to agreeing its policies with with its um, with its allies in in Europe. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, obviously, as you say, that trade deal does kind of raise a certain number of 
questions. Um, Elizabeth. Yes, I think um, probably from a European perspective, watching all the chaos uh, in the US political system of late, uh, probably they felt that uh, who knows what's going to happen in four years or two years or two, two days <laughs> in Washington. And so um, perhaps they were moving forward and I'm sure the Chinese side was certainly pressuring them to do this. Um, but we'll see if it's ratified. Many agreements have not been ratified in Europe, const EU constitutions and so forth. Uh, so we'll see what, what happens uh, and how the Biden administration engages with the EU, because that was not a priority for the Trump administration and perhaps a serious effort on the part of the Biden team to, to have a dialogue about China or about China-Russia issues uh, might uh, change some minds. Um, so, but of course there are reasons to have an EU-China investment agreement that, that um, relate to the issues of business and how European businesses can compete in China. So there, there are some, there's some rationale for this. Um, the timing was, was perhaps unfortunate in terms of the message it might send, as Martin was saying, about the likelihood of some kind of unified response. Yeah, thank you. Um, Martin, any comeback on that? Mm. I guess that we, as, as, as Liz mentioned, it's, it's the early days of, of the administration and um, yeah. probably the dynamics of Sino-American relations in the in the coming in the coming weeks and months can uh, can push the policy or can change the course of, of policy in unexpected ways as well. I mean, I would I would not exclude the uh, the um, some some difficulties between Washington and and Beijing. And the question is, to what extent Russia benefits from it, and to what extent Russia would like to to strengthen its its position vis-a-vis -vis China, capitalizing on the fact that, that China faces growing pressures from, from from the US. But but so far, I understand that the current administration um, intends to keep sanctions which which target both Russian and Chinese companies, especially the recent set of sanctions which which target companies with, with the so-called companies with ties to military to the military. It is. Uh, it, it seems that the current administration intends to to keep these sanctions in place, which which will to some extent push Russia and China a bit closer together. Yeah, I mean, um, you know, the idea of um, sort of joint financial agreements and you know strengthening going forward, um, perhaps as well. Some people have speculated, you know, for Russia to kind of um essentially ha be able to um you know bypass using swift and and so on um i mean i don't know whether um that might be something that would you know that kind of cooperation you know might increase if there are new sanctions i mean obviously um the eu and has discussed a set of new sanctions but i think they decided against it so um we'll have to see um Okay, so um, just finally, uh, Putin did say, describe the Russia-China relationship recently as an allied relationship in the full sense of a multifaceted strategic partnership. <laughs> um, is that just kind of obfuscating language or playing with words? You know, does it actually mean anything at all? Putin says one thing to one audience and another thing to another audience about alliance, the alliance issue. And um, both countries have said that they would not uh, seek an alliance for different reasons. And I think we have to look at on the ground, are they acting like allies? Do they have interoperability of military forces? Uh, do they come to each other's aid in the case of 
uh, a security conflict? Um, do they share, when, in terms of the values, I would say they, that's where they come closest, they share certain values. But I think it, in, the, in the operational sense, I don't see them acting as allies yet. I mean, I think that they float this idea of a poss possibility because that in itself is a deterrent because it, it makes other countries think that there is an alliance or there could be an alliance. Um, but I think we should be careful ab about taking too much um, or, or, by, or reading too much into individual statements because there are a lot of different statements by various different actors on saying that it is or it is not an alliance. And even Putin himself has said to opposite things about this. So I'm, I'm not convinced by that statement alone. Yeah, I mean, you know, he did, in a way, he just kind of really said it was an allied relationship in the full sense of a multifaceted strategic partnership. So even with that phrase, he's kind of really suggesting that it's more like a multifaceted partnership than an alliance. So, um, but yeah, I think, you know, probably um, holding out that prospect is, you know, quite convenient in terms of, you know, um, suggesting to others that it might develop into that kind of relationship. Um, as you say, it, it acts as a kind of deterrent. Martin, final words? Certainly the obstacles that we have observed for the last decades and so the, the unwillingness to, to support each other's most aggressive moves and the, the, un, the realization that entering into an alliance means that each side limits its own room for maneuver is probably the, the biggest the biggest obstacle but at the same time what we have seen at least in terms of how they view um, international politics is that Chinese rhetoric be, becomes more anti-American, has become more anti-American, more anti-US in the for the last couple of months, and it it starts resembling what would what she uh, is, is saying starts re um, resembling what Putin has been saying, uh, what Putin said in in Munich in, in 2007. So in the long term, it it might you know prepare the ground, especially that it comes from from the very top in the case of China. Well, thank you both very much. Um, we have time for Q and A. Um, there are a couple of questions in the chat, but I'd like to invite our patient audience um, to pose further questions. Um, if you can put your questions in the Q and A um, in the Q and A function, I think that's the easiest way um, to tackle them. Um, I we can go to the Q and A now and have a look. Um, so there's a question from uh, Kavor Kaskanyan. Hello, Kavor. Um, and he asks if a long-term fixation um, with its relationship with the US had, and the West more broadly has to a much greater extent been a driver for Russia's attitude towards China rather than the other way around. Um, and then there's a question about the Biden administration, which I think you've probably really um, addressed. Um, much has been made of the possibility of peeling Russia away from China as a way of balancing Beijing, especially by those in the West of a more realist perspective. What are the prospects for this? Now, Martin, I think you addressed that actually in your article recently in Survival, but I think Liz might also have something to say about that. Martin, would you like to take that one? I, th th thank you, Natasha. I would see these ideas as, as impossible to, to implement. I, I mean, one reason is that it's this kind of very simplistic kind of quasi-geopolitical thinking on the part of a number of Western police politicians who, who see that Russia can be easily thrown away from, from China. A, and I, I would say that there are two, two main uh, problems with, with, with it from, from the Western perspective. Firstly, what, what, what actually the West could could offer uh, could offer to Russia without risking a major rift inside the West itself, and secondly, such an approach assumes that, that the Russian Chinese relationship is exclusively about this rational 
objective pursuit of, of power and national interest, which and it ignores the whole complex of of issue of, of questions like the role of domestic politics, the role of domestic actors, and and to, to which I like to return to this impact of unintended consequences and of, of the fact that the relationship is much more complex than, than assuming that it just can be changed with the help of several openings towards towards Russia. And I think that um, the what um, what the mm, signing of uh, with, with the extension of, of the new start mm, has shown is that the US can find some room for for cooperation with Russia on, on very specific issues, but they should not be, we should not expect that they translate into a broader rapprochement between Russia and, and, and the US against against China, which would which would be much more harmful for, for Russia than beneficial. Thank you. And Liz, would you like to add anything? I would agree to that. I I think that there's too much uh, focus on this uh, on the possibility of U.S. maneuvering somehow more successfully in the triangle. And I think that there are real problems in both U.S.-Russia relations and U.S.-China relations that are going to be difficult for the new administration to resolve. And I don't think that these are issues that can be used as bargaining chips with one or the other. And so I think we, I think that's a, that's a pipe dream to be focusing on, on uh, somehow um, peeling Russia off. Because uh, I, I think they do have, as Martin said, there are domestic factors. Uh, I would say there are ideational factors uh, that, um, that, anchor them together for better or worse. And, and I don't think that they're going to um, be inclined to, to overlook these, these, the benefits that they get from the partner, partnership when they have so many problems of their own with the United States. So I, I think what, what's going like, more likely to happen is that, as Martin said, there'll be efforts to engage with each one on issues uh, that uh, can be discussed like um, like arms control or climate change or uh, Arctic uh, search and rescue. Um, I mean, scientific collaboration. I mean, there are there are more areas that can be discussed, and I think the tone might be different on certain issues and during the Trump administration. But I don't see the U.S. having more leverage mm -hmm. at this. Yeah, and I mean, I think, you know, we should bear in mind that, you know, I think sometimes one could be forgiven for thinking that this relationship only got started and got going in 2012, 2014 from, you know, what some people suggest, but actually this has been developing since, you know, for 30 years now, really. Um, so it's not something you're going to just kind of toss, toss out into the garbage. Um, you know, there, there's a lot at stake now, I think, as well. Um, so there are a few more. Um, there's a question here on the um, Indo-Pacific. Um, and so is there any difference? Are there any different approaches? Uh, do China and Russia have different approaches? Some European countries are coming to the Indo-Pacific. I know global Britain is heading there. So I wonder about views of the views of Russia and China. Does, do developments in the Indo-Pacific make them unsafe? Russia may feel sandwiched between Europe and the Indo-Pacific. Are Russia and China challenging the initiative or view in a unified way? I think we kind of partially addressed some of that, but if you'd like to come in on that, either of you, on the Indo-Pacific. Um, I'd just say that for China, it's a much more, it's much more of a security threat because that's China's neighborhood and, and India um, is one of its um, opponents. And uh, if it, to the extent that it links up with other, other challengers in the region that, that makes uh, the security environment much more uh, precarious for China. I mean, for Russia, the issue is more uh, the Russia-India relationship and how it's connected uh, to to U.S. alliances, and 
Russia has a different perception of the Asian security environment and, and um, in previous decades managed to cooperate with the United States to some extent in that, in that region in the 1990s, for example. So, uh, and they also, Russia also has uh, good relations with South Korea and would like to improve relations with Japan. And so, the, so Russia, I think, has a different set of relationships and might might be more concerned about the Indo part than the Pacific part. For for China, it's more about encirclement. Thank you, uh, Martin. Do you want to say anything on that one, or we can move on? I would just very briefly add that I, I um, f f what I think from the Russian perspective is a bit of a non-starter. In terms of yeah. Indo Pacific, is that it is the US, the American idea, and it makes it suspicious by default. Yeah, I think you're right. Although I would say that I think Liz is right to say the fact that it's been rebranded as Indo Pacific. I think Russia does really take umbrage, you know, the idea of India being this beacon of democracy, you know, in that region, you know, when Russia has quite a close relationship with India. I think it's sort of uh, has raised Russia's hackles somewhat, um, you know, but it can't really do very much about it, I think. Um, and and there I would probably say I don't see that Russia and China are going to to challenge the initiative in a unified way, which was part the other part of the question. I don't really see that happening because I think it's fairly compartmentalised, although I know there have been um, exercises and so on. I think that's not really um, something um, you know, very serious in terms of challenging um, the US on Russia's part. Um, but let's move on um, to a question from um, Ivan uh, Ulysses. Hello, hope you're well. <laughs> um, thank you for the fascinating talk. I have a question to the maneuvering and but balancing by the smaller states located between China and Russia presumably Central Asian states, derail the Beijing-Moscow rapprochement? Could a, could a decision by, for example, Tashkent turn the rapprochement into competition? Or is the relationship robust enough to negotiate such unexpected exog exogenous changes? I don't know if either of you would like to take that, or both of you. I'll say something about Mongolia. I've been looking at uh, the, the uh, Mongolia, Russia, China corridor. And I think that, that it introduces new complications um, because smaller states, uh, Mongolia, well, it's not small geographically, but in terms of economic power, and I think similar, similarly in Central Asia are sandwiched between Russia and China and they seek some uh, maneuvering space. And uh, it gives them an opportunity to, uh, to, to look to each one and see uh, which one provides the most benefits, which one is the most concerning in a given issue. And in the case of Mongolia and some, and some water issues, I found that, that Russia was siding with Mongolia against China. And so it gave Russia an opportunity to push back on certain plans that China had for border river development um, that were causing unease in Russia as well as in as in Mongolia. Um, so so it sometimes it, it provides a little bit of space for Russia as well, not just um, not just pressure. So it's an interesting dynamic. Mm, it is, yeah. We don't. We should probably think about Mongolia more often. I mean, yeah, and I think probably in the terms of Central Asian states, I think China tries to prevent uh, this kind of multilateral dialogue, like on water issues with Kazakhstan. Uh, there are no trilateral discussions with Russia, and I think because mm -hmm. China prefers to to uh, be the bigger party. In, in control the negotiation. So, so China is well aware of this, of mm. this uh, potential uh, threat by smaller countries to engage with others. Thank you. Martin, do you want to add anything or shall we move on? Yeah, I, I would see the, um, 
the, the situation is, is certainly worth following, in particular when we talk about Kyrgyzstan and, and Tajikistan. And, uh, it's still not clear why the fourth branch of the Central Asia China gas pipeline has not been has not been completed. And, uh, the revolution in Kyrgyzstan also threatened the Chinese investments in in, in the state. So it, I, I think we, we should fo follow the developments closer and um, see it as as a possible incentive for China to become more assertive in in the region if it if its interests are are threatened. But at the same time, I I. I would argue that from the perspective of smaller states, being able to play Russia and China against each other, it provides them with, with much more room for maneuver than just subordinating their interests to one of these, of these two powers. Okay, thank you. Um, uh, we have a question um, about relating to Vietnam. Um, won't Russia be forced over time to reduce its ties with Vietnam um, because of its economic dependence on China um, and um, because of presumably Vietnam's hostility to China and maybe over time have to side with China over India, um, especially if India gravitates more towards the US. Also, is Iran an important partner for Russia? Well, I think maybe we'll leave that to one side for this discussion because we're kind of trying to focus a bit more on Asia, but if we have time. Yeah, I don't see Russia backing down on its ties to Vietnam and, and no. I think that Russia argues that these are traditional partners. They have nothing to do with anti-China um, policies and that uh, just like China has other partners, Russia is going to have its own uh, friendships in the region. And, and so far, Russia has, has um, only marginally made adjustments on Vietnam in terms of slightly moving one energy investment that was falling into the so-called nine mm. line. Um, I think that's Russia's leverage. They're not going to they're not going to give that up. And they it's more than that. It's it's um, their independent foreign policy. They don't give China the right to dictate who it's who their partners are going to be. So I, I think China, some Chinese scholars are frustrated by that because they see the negative impact for Chinese foreign policy. And I'm sure that there are discussions that happen about it among at the leadership level, but I don't think that, that this is likely to change. Mm. I think that's probably right. <clears throat> Martin? I, I can only agree yeah. with this, on this. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, if we remember that at the time of the Sino-Indian <clears throat> border dispute, Russia uh, still supplied India with the S-400 uh, missiles, so you know, it doesn't really seem that they were particularly taking Chinese uh, feelings, let's say, into account. Um, in fact, they accelerated the transfer. Yeah, in fact, yeah, they did, right. Um, and then a question from Zach Pekin. Hi, Zach. What will the Russia-China partnership look like in 10 years or 20 years? <laughs> nice easy question for you there. If Russia West relations remain hostile, is there anything that China can do that would cause Moscow to want to pivot back towards Europe? If I can start on this <laughs> question, pondering uh, possible scenarios for sign Russian relations for the UISS in Paris last year. I, I would say that the, the biggest question when trying to imagine China Russian relations in 10 or 20 years is, is, is the answer to the question what is Russia going to look like in 10 or 20 in 10 or, or 20 years while um, this partnership with, with China is certainly multi-leveled and that is embedded in, in a number of uh, segments of, of, of society I think we should not uh, forget that there is quite a strong backlash both in uh, Navalny type uh, opposition, which 
perceives the relationship with China as driven by corruption and China as supporting uh, the corrupt Russian elite. And on the other hand, um, the strong nationalist opposition towards, uh, towards China. So while the, in the current political climate, the Russian government managed to, to suppress most of the anti-Chinese voices, I, I would see the possibility of shifts in the relationship in, in case of domestic, deep domestic changes in Russia. Um, that's great. And also partly answers the next question in the Q&A, um, Liz. I'll answer from the, the China point of view. I think uh, what, what happens with China will also be of, be of great importance. For example, is China going to become involved in some regional conflicts as it becomes mm. more assertive. For example, what if if what if uh, Xi Jinping decides to try to retake Taiwan? Um, then what does Russia do? <laughs> right. Yeah. I think that would be a real a real uh, strain on mm. on the kind of partnership. Uh, could Russia actually be neutral in that kind of a situation? Um, and mm. that's one of the factors that led to the collapse of the previous uh, of the, of the Sino-Soviet alliance mm -hmm. in the 1950s when the Soviet Union refused to support China's uh, efforts towards Taiwan? Or, or what if the conflict between China and India uh, uh, deepens and becomes more militarized? Mm -hmm. um, so I think that, that these kinds of conflicts would would really test the ability of Russia to main, main, maintain its neutrality. And you would see um, how Russia would act in these kinds of situations. You know, another, another uh, factor would be domestically in China. If China faces many pressures um, with its ethnic minorities, the effort to repress in ethnic expression. Um, so, what what kind of trajectory domestically will China have? Will it become more authoritarian? Will it become more fractious? Mm -hmm. and factors there also. Great. Um, there was a question which is related, you know, about um, opposition to China domestically, you know, from ordinary people, anti-Chinese sentiment um, that that is held by ordinary people, sort of differently to to the Russian government, let's say. Um, so, um, you know, they're basically saying, um, will domestic opinion in Russia have any bearing on future relations? I think, Martin, you kind of answered that question, probably. I mean, I think one thing one can say is that in the 1990s, there was a lot more anti-China feeling, which was also often played up. Um, and used by particular political forces in the regions in particular. And we don't really see that to the same extent now, partly because there was a kind of bit of a clampdown in general um, and it became a bit of a taboo um, topic, if you like. Um, but I guess also because perhaps, um, you know, people can see greater benefits to some extent. I mean, it's difficult. I think in the Russian Far East, I think I'm not sure that there is anti-China sentiment to the extent that one might think there would be. But I don't know if you want to comment, Liz. Well, I was, I was there in, in the fall of 2018 and mm. there were a few surprising features that I noticed. One is that there's a lot more back and forth among people in the region. Mm. So that uh, seniors from Russia will retire to China. That's right. A bit like English people retiring to Spain. <laughs> right. Uh, we'll go to the dentist in China and, you know, and, and, and so on. So there's a lot, and there are actual real Chinese tourists that you do see in, in Vladivostok and, and other places. And, and the public opinion polls in the regions show um, more positive views of China. Um, but I think that also reflects the, the anti-American mood in the, in the Russian media. So Russia, yeah. Russia, oh. the Russian views of the U.S. in the region have declined mm -hmm. considerably compared to what they were in, in the '90s. Um, however, you don't what you don't see is a lot of regional cooperation. So, uh, the regional agreement um, 
between Russia and China had recently expired and was only marginally um, completed. And the new agreement totally scrapped the old projects and created new ones, much more targeted ones. And the parties that are involved are mostly state-owned companies, not regional companies. Mm -hmm. And when you have regional projects, they tend to cause a lot of a lot of trouble, like the Baikal water bottling uh, project that that was scrapped. Um, uh, small scale Chinese sawmills create a lot of opposition. Oh yeah, the timber trade. Yeah, right. Mm -hmm. And then on a popular level, people are still skeptical of buying uh, Chinese produce, and and there are certain um, stereotypes that persist. So I think I think that there's still um, concern about about border security and the different approaches that the two countries have with Russia really being concerned about maintaining the sanctity of its border regions and China being more open to border zones, um, which might potentially disregard sovereignty. Um, so I, I think that, that that's a stumbling block for regional cooperation that they have yet to overcome. If I can very briefly follow up on yeah. this. One of the problems with the relationship is that we haven't seen any major, uh, let's put it, non-geopolitical projects between Russia and China that would that could convince the both populations that this cooperation goes beyond um, kind of high politics. The prob what is going to be interesting is to, to follow whether the joint project of a uh, wide body jet, which is uh, co-produced, which is to be co-produced by, by China and Russia is going to be completed. This would be one of the first examples of, of genuine civilian cooperation and not, not going beyond also the type of trade between the tweet that we have seen so far. Mm -hmm. um, I think we've only got a couple of minutes left, so unfortunately we're not going to be able to get to all of the questions, but there's one on the likely nuclearization of North Korea, which may well be accepted by China. Um, won't that alarm Russia and strain China-Russia relations? Sorry, I didn't understand that. The, the uh, denuclearization or? Yeah, they're talking about the nuclearization of North Korea which might be accepted by China. I mean, I don't really see China accepting nuclearization of Korea, personally. Do you? No, I, no. I, I, I think that both countries are concerned about... Yes, I think, I don't think anyone really wants the nuclearization of North Korea, apart from maybe North Korea, probably. Yeah. I think where they differ, perhaps, is what happens to a united Korea. United it's, Korea. Yeah, a united Korea would be something different. Yeah. I think China is more concerned about that outcome than Russia, because for Russia, having another, assuming it was not a mm -hmm. state with uh, a, US, uh, a US force or tightly involved with the mm -hmm. US, I think it might allay some security fears for Russia having another mm, you know, another medium-sized power yeah yeah um I don't know if we're going to have the plug pulled on us um or not um there's another a question from Pete Duncan hi Pete um asking about Africa have Russia and China divided Africa into spheres of influence e.g Russia and Central African Republic China and Zambia blah 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 thus avoiding conflict there I, I I would speculate because I I'm, I have not been following the the Russian policy towards Russian policy towards Africa, but I would speculate here that we are that we observe a similar process to the one in in the Balkans, or mm. in the Middle East, where where Russia and China are because they are using they use so different such such different instruments, they are able to reconcile their interests. They are they operate in different segments, different sectors of of those states, and are able to 
and are still able to coexist, but not necessarily coordinate their their efforts. Yeah, I think I mean I have been following it a bit, and I think I would agree with that, Liz. I would just say uh, look at the vaccine situation because uh, there was I was just looking at that yesterday, and there's like in Central Asia, you see different countries uh, choosing Sputnik or Chinese vaccines, and I think that's an interesting development to see. Is that because that's an area where presumably you would think China might have the edge, but Russia is, I think, trying to to make its brand uh, mm. mm -hmm. better known in that respect as well. I mean, I think it is an interesting development, but I think talking about spheres of influence maybe is a little bit too, um, you know, too much. Um, and we have to remember that. You know, for example, Central African Republic is a kind of francophone country. You know, there are other there are other players, if you like, as well. Um, and I think that's been a factor for Russia. Um, you know, it's been a kind of engaging in certain kind of anti-French uh, sort of rhetoric um, in some parts of Africa. Um, and there was a question about the Balkans, the dynamic between China's growing economic interest in the Balkans and Russia's more traditional historic, political and cultural interests. And I think Martin kind of touched on that already. Um, so again, in the Balkans, you see there's a kind of division, well, division of labor, if you like, but not in a formal way. I mean, they haven't kind of agreed on a kind of program or a plan of how to do things. It's just the way that it's working out. Is that what you would say on the Balkans? Yeah. We've got one final question. I think we've actually managed to answer them all. Um, basically, I think this person's saying there are 370,000 Chinese students in the US, 20,000 Chinese students in Russia. So can you comment on the educational rapprochement between Russia and China? <laughs> That's always been a sore spot in terms of uh the soft power uh, issue. And it's, it's just a fact that uh, Chinese elementary school students learn English. And so they're better placed to go study in American universities than to, mm -hmm. to study in Russian ones. Uh, but mm -hmm. that's a problem going forward in terms of preparing experts for the future. And for, that goes back to that question of the future of the relationship. Mm -hmm. Um, because Russian isn't seen as a career builder in, in China for the most part, except perhaps in Northern China or maybe in Western China. Um, and so there, there, the, there's a, not a lot of Russia experts anymore. That There's an older generation that was trained in the 50s that's retired. And you have uh, younger people coming up, but not that many. Um, and so if this relationship is going to move forward, you do need personnel on both sides. I think this is a, an issue in Russia as well. Gabuyev has written about the problem of China expertise in, in uh, Russia. So you need, do need people who, who are motivated to, to work in this partnership. And so that's, that's part of that puzzle. What will the relationship be in the next decade or two? Thank you, Liz. Any final words, Martin? <clears throat> it, it is, I, I guess, also the problem of uh, to what extent China is, is able to attract Russians as, as a place to to live and, and as opposed to Europe. So uh, apart from, from these border regions, we, ha we haven't seen Russian companies going to the Shanghai Stock Exchange and, and in, investing that much in, in China. So. I think if we discuss the future of, of the relationship, the lack of these, this type of ties is certainly a long-term obstacle. Mm -hmm. And just one, if we're not going to have the plug pulled on us, there's just one more question, maybe final question. Will Russia and China continue with the BRICS in a quest for mul multipolarity? Or are they dead? I think they'll continue. Will, will, will they succeed in their quest? Uh, 
that is another another matter. I, I, I think these multilateral fora are, are um, don't. I mean, there there's a, a part of a. It, it's more of a presentation of or an aspiration mm -hmm. rather than a confirmation of an existent um, multipolarity. Um, mm -hmm. But I mean, we going back to my vaccine fixation today, uh, <laughs> if you look at where, uh, where China is testing its vaccines, you see it doing so in BRICS, in some BRICS countries. And so mm -hmm. it is a vehicle for certain economic outreach. And we've seen also some um, naval exercises among some of the countries. And so you do see some, some outcomes, though I don't know that we've seen a, a systemic a change in the in the global balance of power. Mm -hmm. Martin, so I, I would return to, to to the beginning of our of our discussion the, the question of of asymmetry and from from this perspective I wonder to what extent we we should speak about multipolarity and to what extent we see the, uh, the, the a system in which there is the U.S. China and on the other later other 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 players mm, right yeah okay well i think we've covered quite a lot here and um thank you to the audience for your questions um which were thought provoking and um forced us to, to range across a huge number of topics um i'm sorry if we didn't answer all of them but i think we probably answered nearly all of them there was just one really quick one about mongolia will China forced Mongolians to learn Mandarin and stop them learning Mongolian. Um, but I don't know if you really know the answer to that question. Mongolians in Mongolia? Or in Sorry? Mongolians in Mongolia? Or Mongolians in Inner Mongolia? Well, that's the thing that isn't clear from the question, oh. actually. Uh, well, in Mongolia, <laughs> definitely not. <laughs> but uh, Inner Mongolia, they're, they're doing their best to promote Mandarin instruction at the expense of Mongolian, uh, causing uh, causing protests uh, in a region that has not been known for it. So that was probably a yeah. productive move. Yes, yeah, so maybe they did mean in the Mongolia then. Um, <laughs> it wasn't clear. Okay, well, um, all that remains is for me to thank both of you, Dr. Martin Kashmarsky and Dr. Elizabeth Wishnik, um, for coming along. Um, and, you know, really um, engaging uh, so well with the topic, um, you know, which obviously is quite a complex um, topic. Um, you know, I re think we really, you know, you did really well um, to range over so many different areas um, and you had answers for pretty much everything, um, which is always nice. Um, and I shall now go and read up on all these vaccines. Um, you've <laughs> kind of opened up a new area of research there. Um, thank you, Elizabeth, for that. Um, I really enjoyed the discussion. Thank you both again for coming. Enjoy your day, Elizabeth, and enjoy your evening, Martian. And thank you very much to the School of Security Studies, to uh, Danny McDavitt for um, moderating and um, setting us up um, with the discussion. Thank you, everybody. Good night. Thank you. Thank Bye you very now. much. Thank you for having Bye. us here. Thank you. Goodbye. Goodbye.